Hello everyone, so today we are going to get into what is sometimes referred to as the second industrial revolution in which we will see some greater innovation and change. So let's just get right into it. And so what we mean, what, what's this whole like second industrial revolution thing? Basically what we're going to see in the industrial revolution is we're going to get a kind of an even further explosion of it. It's going to get bigger, but we're also going to see a shift in different things that are actually being used by people. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, you're going to have kind of some new base products, if you will. So leading up into this time, it's really all about like coal and steam and stuff like that. And now we're going to make the switch to like steel, chemicals, electricity, and petroleum, okay? There's also going to be massive amounts of new products to buy and services that you can actually use that will come up as a result of this. I'll be getting that into my society uh, presentations later on, so keep your eye out for those. Uh, and we also see even further expansion of industry and just increased amount of labor, so more and more workers than we had ever seen before. Okay, steel. Let's let's just do this. We're going to build a lot. Now, up at this point, steel is going to replace iron. Okay, iron was very effective. We built lots of things from it. It's very hardy and durable. I mean, you know, the, the, the Eiffel Tower is still rocking. But steel is actually even better. Why is it better? Well, it's lighter and stronger. Okay, so you can have something that's lighter and stronger. It also doesn't rust to the degree or really at all, especially compared to iron, and you can actually build it to make faster machines, engines, and railways. So, I mean, you know, and it's shiny. I mean, who doesn't like shiny stuff? Um, really, the top producers of steel would be Great Britain, and that eventually will shift to Germany, and then later on the United States during this second industrial period. Um, and probably one of the best early examples of what you could do with steel was the uh, home insurance building in Chicago. This was an 11 story building when, when it was first created and, and this is the world's first building that actually uses steel for its interior and actually part of its exterior frame. Um, and you see a gentleman on the right there putting in the rivets to the steel beams. This is transformative because it allows you to just build and build and build. I mean, look, we have the, the Burj Khalifa Tower today, which I believe is over 2,700 feet tall, um, which is, you know, way taller than an 11-story building. But you can't build things like that without steel. I mean, it is vital. And, and also we can throw in the steel warships that are going to get built eventually in the late 1800s. And so those are the ships that we're used to seeing today. Um, I, I mean, and then you'll get stainless steel, which is going to be great for like things like medical instruments. Um, and then also we'll be able to use steel for cars. I mean, this, this is just a transformative item, okay, that will change the world. Now, we will also get the creation of the chemical industry. Now we have goods and bads here, okay? You know, chemicals can do a lot of good things and they help us in a variety of different ways, you know, maybe I'll just go like clean my counter later. I use some chemicals for that. But there are, of course, also some major side effects. And we've had some natural, not natural disasters, but like man-made disasters um, because of uh, exposure to chemicals. So we, there is a give and take here. But it is going to get huge. On the right, there is a massive chemical plant in uh, Germany. Okay. And, and what are we using? We have our alkalite um products that's going to help us make things like soaps and textiles and things for the paper industry. Artificial dyes are going to be a huge thing with chemicals. Cleaners are going to be another thing that we get with chemicals. And it will also help revolutionize the photography industry because things like um, photographic plates and films are, you know, you need chemicals for those to actually work. And so what spawns out of the chemical industry will end up being your photography industry as well. And we have, um, the, the two guys that really revolutionized photography, and it will it it will adjust over time, and you get George Eastman over in the United States as well. But really, it's it's um, nice for a nice piece or nice piece nipsy. I I'm, I always mess it up, but nice for a and Louis Daguerre. Okay, nice for a is the guy that really comes out in front as as the first guy to take what we would refer to as a picture as you see on the left there, that is a boy with a horse, okay? It looks like a drawing, it's not, it's an actual picture, okay? He eventually is going to go into partnership with Louis Daguerre, who was also investigating this type of thing, and they're gonna work together. Now, Nysphore dies suddenly, I believe in 1833, when he's very young, and Louis Daguerre is gonna take the work and continue, and eventually we're gonna get pictures like you see here. That is Louis Daguerre, 
Uh, and that's why the early pictures that we know of today or photographs will be known as daguerreotypes. And this is actually a picture of that today. And I don't think I have to get into the importance of photography for us today, but you know, be, be careful of the pictures that you take and post kids. Just be, be aware, okay? Public service announcement. All right, and now we're going to get things like electricity. I mean, this is this is huge, you know, game changer. So the two titans behind electricity are actually Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell, okay? Did they build anything? Well, they built some things, but these guys are actually really important because they're the ones that figure out how electricity works, and it is their both theoretical and practical work that allows us to do all the things that we have with electricity today. Yes, guys like Edison and Nikola Tesla will do things later, Heinrich Hertz, but these are the guys that are, are the, the, the key ones, okay? So Michael Faraday, what did he do? Well, he was important for a variety of different reasons, but basically he's able to figure out how electrical currents can move through wires um, and be contained by magnets. Okay, in essence, he is able to understand how electromagnetic induction actually works and use it in a practical way. And what's important is his work will provide the basis for power stations in the future. Okay, James Clerk Maxwell, on the other hand, is the guy that figures out all the mathematical equations that actually govern how electromagnetism works, and he actually proves how electricity and magnetisms are actually one in the same. And that's really important, especially being the fact that electromagnetism is one of the forces that govern the universe, so the guy that comes up with the equations on how that works is a slightly important individual that none of you have even heard of. Now I have his uh, equations that are on there. I don't know what any of them mean, but that's, I mean, that's, that's fine. You know, I don't even need to know them. But, um, I mean, you know everything that we have with electricity, guys. It's, it's an understatement. I'm, I'm on a computer that uses electricity, okay, in a room with lights and TVs and all sorts of stuff like that, although you probably could do without the TV. But anyway, um, what his equations also do is predict the existence of non-visible light in which people were able to use his equations and then do further experiments in the future, which will be proven and we'll have things like x-rays and gamma rays and infrared and ultraviolet light, which all will come, you know, spawn back, if you will, to the work of James Clerk Maxwell. Now, advances in electric work in 1870, we have our first commercial generators. In 1881, the first public power station is open in Britain. That is actually a picture of it to the right. In 1910, we have hydroelectric power will be developed using dams and steam-fired coal plants. And that basically all leads to today's system, okay? We have a central power generate, generating station, okay? We have big transformers that will that will move the power around. We still use these giant poles with wires that are connected to our houses. That is the system. So our modern day electrical system is created at this time. Now, some guys that are important to some inventions that we use, of course, we have Thomas Edison with the light bulb, but with many, if you do not know, there's also a British man by the name of Joseph Swan who independently created one in England, okay, and their work on the incandescent light bulb, of course, would continue on, and even though we might not use their pure work anymore in incandescent light bulbs with LEDs and all sorts of stuff like that, this is what got started, this idea of, like, you know, light in the home. It's kind of important. Then, of course, we have Alexander Graham Bell on the left invents the telephone for communication. Not that you even know what a regular landline telephone looks like anymore, but hey, they're still important. What's kind of interesting on the right there, you see a switchboard. Way back in the day, you actually would have to call a central switchboard who would connect you to whoever it is that you were trying to call. And maybe they'd listen. I don't know. I'd like to think that they were above that. I mean, I'd, I'd probably listen. But... Um, the telephone, you guys know all about the phone, okay? The biggest one of all of these, though, was the invention of the radio by Guglielmo Marconi. And yes, on the bottom there, that is the original radio. Um, this absolutely transforms the world. And, and let's look at it at an immediate perspective. In the 19-teens, when this invention came out and then blows up in the 1920s, what it leads to is greater national unity. And I know it sounds crazy, but it does, because now with the spread of news and 
sports and even like fun programs like radio serial shows and stuff like that, people have this awareness of what is going on in their country and around them. And perhaps they also get an awareness of the world. And the spread of information has always been crucial. I mean, you go back to guys like Johan Gutenberg, and then you have Marconi, and then we have the TV and the internet. You know, all of these things are based on the idea of let's get out information. And yes, we can listen to music and use it for entertainment on sports or something, but the radio dramatically changed culture, okay? And every society, you know, that could develop this had one. Now, of course, the work on the radio would eventually lead to things like the television, wireless technology, and the internet. So yes, Marconi's invention is, is of extreme importance, okay? But it also has a, has a core level of, of bringing people together. And I think that's the underestimated or understated part, not estimated, the understated part of his invention. Okay, and another thing now, here we go, because this uses a little bit of electricity, and of course, a lot of gasoline, the internal combustion engine. The internal combustion, can, yeah, the internal combustion engine was invented by Nicholas August Otto in Germany. There is a prototype of his on the right. Uh, it was a four-stroke engine. This engine is more efficient than steam. This engine can be more powerful than steam. This engine can also be lighter than steam, and we can use it for everything. Of course, the car is the key one, and the world will slowly but surely be transformed by the car. I just wish there were a lot less of them. I hate to drive. There's just too many people in Jersey. I just, I just can't. Anyway, um, but we also use in things like lawnmowers and weed whackers and your early plane engines. Eventually, that'll change to jet engines. But I mean, it, it, it's huge. It's, it's one of the single most important individual inventions in the history of mankind. Now, of course, guys will improve on it, and that man will be Gottlieb Daimler. He's the gentleman on the bottom right there, and he will make it lighter, and with that, he is going to create the car. On the right is one of the world's first Mercedes. That was the name of the um, company that he created. He would later go into partnership with a man by the name of Carl Benz, who was making some really good uh, cars on his own, and together, Mercedes-Benz is born in Germany. And of course, whether it's Mercedes-Benz or BMWs or even Volkswagen, the Germans are known for high-end cars, and this is where it started. Now, another guy that's important in cars and even bigger than those two other guys is Henry Ford. Now, yes, I know Henry Ford's an American, and so is Edison, but look. Henry Ford basically loved cars, okay, and he wanted cars to go to, like, the next level. The problem was is that the cars were just too darn expensive. The process to make them took too long, the materials were expensive, and, and he just couldn't charge a low enough price. And so instead of actually examining the car, what he is going to do is examine the way the car is made. On the right here is a Model T factory, okay, or Ford factory making Model T cars. The Model T would be the world's most bought car in history. Millions of these things were made and bought. Um, and I believe only in like the last five years, I want to say, I believe the Corolla from Toyota uh, was able to pass it. But I mean, for 90 years, still the most sold car was the Ford Model T. That gives you an idea of how many of these things could be bought. But what he did was examine the process and what he, he was able to do was to transform how we make things by the use of the automated assembly line. Yes, assembly lines existed before him and yes, we also had um, interchangeable parts and all that type of stuff, but Ford was the one that put all that together. He made the most efficient um, assembly line that you could find. He also did things like was study his um, employees movements and he did little things like lift tools off the ground, um, allow them to pull things down from above. Um, the workers stayed in one spot. As you can see here, the cars move on a conveyor belt to them. And eventually what that did was it reduced the car down to a cost of $350, which actually made it available for his own workers to buy, which on a side note, he increased their salaries so that they could do it. Um, the, the Ford Model T is, is transformative, and the car industry today is one of the biggest industries in the world 
Okay, it's one of the most important industries of the world. And that all goes back to really Ford of exploding it. No, he did not create the car. Okay, that's very important to understand. He did not invent the car, but the process of that. And then to go along with that, anything that is mass produced in the world is done this way. Now, a lot of times there's robots that are doing it, but everything from food to sneakers to socks to televisions to like, you know, missiles. I mean, it's all done using Ford's techniques. And so that is... To, to say that's impactful is, is, again, probably one of the understatements of the century. And then finally, we have flight. Now, you did have uh, balloons that were invented before this, hot air balloons, but they weren't really great for transportation. Okay, on the right, you had the creation of the Zeppelin. Okay, the Zeppelin had an engine. It was what we used to call a dirigible. It was very much used extensively in Europe, all the way, actually, all the way through the 30s into the 40s. Um, Zeppelins were big, uh, they could transport lots of people, and it was faster than, say, land travel at the time. Uh, Zeppelins, of course, never catch on in the United States of America because of the Hindenburg disaster, but they were still really important. But at this time, I mean, the biggest advance would be flight. And then here on the bottom left, you have Orville and Wilbur Wright in the opening slide for this section. I had a picture of the first flight. Um, we put these men together because from what we know, they were complete partners. They always worked together. They did everything together. They theorized together. And the process in which they figured out how to fly was really remarkable. They basically learned how to fly first. They did gliders and all sorts of stuff. And then eventually in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on an area known as the, today we call them the Outer Banks, uh, they were able to fly. And there's a picture, I believe, of Orville in the, uh, no, I think that's Wilbur, but I could be wrong. I, this is This is huge. I mean... Everything to do with flight today, all the stuff, whether it's shipping, whether it's people, whether it's war, uh, flight was transformed. But it wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the internal combustion engine, electricity, and, and all of this stuff works together. And so we have massive modernization of the world. The world has become more and more familiar to us that we see back then, and, and it's just not going to change. All right, guys, so uh, make sure you, know, you get your notes for this, and, and I'll see you guys soon.